Awesome. All righty. So where we're going to pick up, pick up the study today is on page 156. And so, yeah, it's always so lovely, like having people that help out with stuff like that. Ah, delightful. So where we're at is 156. And uh, what's happened kind of in, in the story so far, because we've been diving and delving into the history. And so just to give a very quick, brief, expediated, perhaps at moments slightly historically inaccurate summary of what's happened. So one of our intrepid co-founders, Bill Wilson, he has give, been given knowledge of, of what our problem is, the hopeless nature of our illness as a result of going to the town's hospital and relapsing and relapsing, who comes to his door as a friend of his by the name of Abby Thatcher is armed with facts about the solution, which is a spiritual awakening, a spiritual experience, and, and a way to get that, which is what has become our 12 steps. Bill Wilson, he checks himself into the town's hospital. He works the steps. He's a profound spiritual awakening. And then six months later, after working with others, he's got a business trip to Akron, Ohio. Exciting stuff. And he goes to Akron, Ohio. He's going to combine these companies, rubber tires and stuff. We were talking about tires before the meeting. So make sure you come. It's very exciting early. We talk about the most exciting stuff. Temperature, tires. Woo you're not missing anything. All right. And so he was going to combine these companies, but it got all bogged down in a lawsuit and nobody was talking and he's in this hotel feeling broken and discredited and humiliated. And from there, he's in that lobby and to, to one side of him is the hotel bar. You can hear the laughter and the joy and the merriment. And to the left of him is, is the telephone booth. And in that moment, he feels Maybe I could handle, let's say, six drinks, no more. And fear grips him. But in that moment, he's restored to sanity because he had been working with other alcoholics for those past six months. And he goes to the telephone booth and lifts the receiver. And by a course of miracles, any of those calls are missed. Any call is not returned. We might not be here, but he gets connected with our other intrepid co-founder, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob had been in the Oxford group and he and he wasn't, I mean, he had messed up Mother's Day. I don't think any of us could ever relate to ruining an important holiday of our loved ones. But Dr. Bob, he, he ruined Mother's Day. I know Henrietta Steigerling, I was going to gloss over her, but how could you not? She's the best. She's one of the non-alcoholics who answered the call and got them connected and, and had, had a prayer group for Dr. Bob. And it's always a reminder for me that my 12 step with uh, work with others might just be an answer to somebody's prayer. And if I'm not, if I'm struggling with the belief in something greater than myself, is it possible that my sobriety is evidence of a power greater than myself? Anywho, so they get connected and, and out of guilt and shame and remorse for messing up Mother's Day, he meets, he, Dr. Bob meets with Bill and he's like only 15 minutes, but they stay for over five hours. And see, Bill spoke with him about the illness. Bill spoke with him about the physical allergy. Bill spoke to him about the mental obsession. And Dr. Bob was like, this is the first guy who spoke to me in my language, who knew what he was talking about from experience. And Dr. Bob said, that's it. I'm willing to do absolutely anything. I mean, not amends, but anything else, you know? And so he goes along for a little while doing everything but amends. And he goes to Atlantic City and has a terrible relapse. You know, one of those bed, I'm sure no one can relate to a bender that was uh, quite humiliating and, you know, any of those ruining professional standing, that sort of thing. So he goes on one of those and he comes back beaten and broken. And he has to have surgery that next day and they give him, you know, a couple sedatives and, and a bottle of beer. And he goes to, to, goes to do surgery and he goes after surgery on, on what I call an amender. Because that's what I ought to do after I go on a bender is, is dive back into the work. It's not what happened. It's what wasn't happening. And he goes on an amender and he's willing to do all the things he wasn't willing to do. And he makes those amends and he sets that right. And where we left off was the mi very middle of the page. And it says at midnight, he came home exhausted, but very happy. He is not 
had a drink sense. Often permanent sobriety is on the other side of actions that I'm not necessarily wanting to take. And so where we're, we're going to pick up is, is the paragraph that starts, but life was not easy for the two friends. And that's a reminder that just because I'm, I'm in recovery does not mean life is going to be easy. Life will continue to be life. Life was not easy for the two friends. Plenty of difficulties presented themselves. And I'm sure no one here at the study can relate to life difficulties, right? You guys just show up and everything's unicorns and, and, and rainbows. Um, no life stuff. But I mean, for, you know, Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob and Bill, they, they had some troubles. And both saw that they must keep spiritually active. And that is my response to difficulties is spiritually active. First and foremost, working with others. So one day they called up the head nurse of a local hospital. This was very likely the Akron City Hospital. And it says they explained their need, their need to work with somebody else. See, I'm big that 12-step work is not top tier for the nerds like us with the highlighters. It's a minimum requirement for someone like me. So both saw that they must keep spiritually active. Um, and so, uh, they sorry, they explained their need and inquired if she had a first-class alcoholic prospect. Give me a good one. She replied, yes, we've got a corker. He's just beating up a couple nurses. And I just, I love that, you know? And if, if you're wondering, in the unofficial, unofficial, because it's not an official 1930s dictionary, there's one that's commonly used, but in the off-brand version one that I have, uh, a corker, it would be like a clever fellow, or maybe more apt, in this case, a rousing story. Like, hey, do you got like a, a somebody that we can help? Oh, boy. Do we ever have someone you can help? Like it's that sort of tone. Oh yeah. So he's beaten up a couple nurses, goes off his head completely when he's drinking. But he's a grand chap when he's sober and that goes off his head completely when he's drinking. That idea of a uh, real Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, that's likely an indication that this gentleman has the physical allergy that inability to control the amount that he takes. Because I am just gonna suppose that if you don't have alcoholism, you're probably not drinking yourself into the position of beating up nurses. I will suppose that. Like, you know what I mean? I am sure there are people that are out there living their lives, having a margarita on the beach and not once. have gotten a little fisty with the medical community. You know what I'm saying? And uh, our fisty friend, and if you're wondering what he looks like, if you look over Rob's shoulder, there he is. It's, it's Bill Dodson. And uh, and Bill Dodson, our fisty fella, uh, he, he's our corker, and he is known as AA number three. And, and we're going to see his experience. But when it talks about um, how he was um, goes off his head when drinking, again, it's a sign that he has an allergy. So, but he's a great, he's a grand chef when he's sober, though he's been in here eight times in the last six months. And one of the things I want to point out about that is that is likely a sign that he has that mental obsession, right? And can I relate to that? Can I relate to trying hospitals, rehabs, detoxes, treatment centers? Maybe it didn't look like that. Maybe it looked like psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors. Did I try these things? Or did I end up in the emergency room again and again and again? And I don't know about you, but I know about me when I came to, you know, in those predicaments, it was a real, I am never going to do this again. And that's a sign that that had no effect. And we're going to see some other signs that he's got that mental obsession. And for anyone that's new or coming back or not sure what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the obsession of the mind, that is that thought that I have when I am as sober as I am today that tells me that little lie in a voice that I believe. This time will be different. Nobody will ever know. I'll go out for three drinks and so on and so forth. That is what we're talking about. And so a sign. Eight times in the last six months, he might have this thing. Understand he was once a well-known lawyer in town. 
but just now we've got them strapped down tight. And it again, it's, it's quite a visual. Uh, and just go into the comments. Um, so uh, this is Bill Dotson. He ran for, yeah, he ran for city councilman. He lost, we're gonna get to where he lost the election. Um, his wife was also named Henrietta. Uh, and you know, what's interesting is that's why the stories in the back of the book have changed. Because if we just kept the original stories, it would be a Bill, it would be a Bob, be another Bill. We'd get a couple of Williams, maybe a Robert, you know, or two. Heck, even a Richard, who knows? And then, and then their wives, Anne, Henrietta, Lois, and this, you know, the same name. So that's why the stories have changed to represent the current membership more accurately. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm reading and I'm like, ooh, but I'm gonna say that in just a sec. So don't, don't you worry. And I always appreciate the little notes. So, um, and so actually the just a sec was right now. So. Uh, Bill Dotson was hospitalized on uh, June 26th of 1935. That was his sobriety date. And the date that he was visited by Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob was June 28th of 1935. And I want to point something out, June 28th of 1935, in about a page or so, I'm going to come back to the date. And it's going to really emphasize a point that I make regularly and for those that have been coming regularly is probably annoying. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> so here was a prospect, all right, but by the description, none too promising. The use of spiritual principles, again, the spiritual principles are very simply the 12 steps. That's what they are. The use of these 12 steps in such cases was not so well understood as it is now. But one of the friends said, Put them in a private room, we'll be down. It was probably Dr. Bob that said that because he had a little bit more pull in the hospital. And uh, one of the things is sister, in the chat, you'll see Sister Ignatia, um, they had them secretly uh, treated. So we spoke about Sister Ignatia, one of those non-alcoholic, you know, just amazing women that if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. And she would regularly sneak alcoholics into the hospital under false names, under false diagnosis, um, because the hospitals didn't want to deal with people like us. And so, yeah, it's just kind of a fun little, yeah, history. I love the history. I hope you do too. And if you don't, that's okay. Uh, so put them in a private room. We'll be down. Two days later, a future fellow of Alcoholics Anonymous stare glassily at the strangers beside his bedside. That glassily is that, what are you guys doing here? That confusion that, you know, I don't, not fully, you know, when you kind of just disassociate middle distance, this coach, it's a little like that. And maybe you're well-functioning and you don't do that. So tell me about that later. What's that like? All right. <laughs> so he stared glassily at the strangers beside his bed. Who are you fellas? And why this private room? I was always in a ward before. Said one of the visitors, we're given, giving you a treatment for alcoholism. Hopelessness was written large on the man's face. And that's one of those themes, that hopeless to hope. And it's only when I can accept the hopelessness of my predicament that I'm willing to accept the hope that's on offer in these 12 steps in this way of life. And so that hopelessness written large on his face is actually good news. And for those of us who have experienced sponsoring, you guys kind of know what I'm talking about. You know, when you're sitting down with somebody and they're like, what's it now? I got plans. I got designs. I got ideas. It's like, oh boy. But when somebody's beaten and broken, just like I was, it's like, man, we got a shot. So hopelessness was written large on the man's face. He replied, oh, but that's no use. Nothing would fix me. I'm a goner. Another way to describe hopelessness. I'm going to die of this thing. The last three times I got drunk on the way home from here. Again, a sign, a sign that he's got the mental obsession. Has anyone here ever been to treatment and then relapsed on their way home from treatment? You know what I mean? Well, no, that's okay. But like that sort of thing. You know what I'm saying? That like, man, I'm never going to do it again. A moment later doing it again. A power of the mental obsession. And he says, I'm afraid to go out the door. I can't understand it. Um, and 
actually a fun fact about the private room that, that Rob threw in the chat, which I'm so here for. It says Bill D uh, said when he was in the private room, he wasn't sure if he was going to die, you know, like get, get a not good diagnosis or whether his wife was going to leave him. So, I mean, all I'm saying is how unpleasant is meeting your sponsor? You know what I mean? It's way better than death or divorce. Even, yes, even your sponsor, even yours. Yes, yes. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> so uh, it says for over two hours, the friends told them about their experiences. And that's what I meant to do in working with others, sharing my experiences, their drinking experiences. Sorry. Over and over, he would say, that's me. That's me. I drink like that. So they're trying to qualify him. They're trying to, to get him to relate. There is, man, there's something disarming about here is my experience. What about you? As opposed to here's what you need to do. I think many of us have heard well enough of that. And then it says, the man in the bed. And I just, it's an interesting place to pause the man in the bed. If you've ever seen, there's this um, famous picture uh, that we see in and around AA and in and around the room um, of two 12-step two, uh, members. And yeah, Rob's got it. That's the stained glass version. That's the fancy one. Uh, and it was painted for uh, the grapevine, I believe, and it's actually quite small. It's um, just postcard size. And uh, it's a dramatic painting, like not a historically accurate one of this moment. And it's entitled The Man on the Bed. And so this moment of two alcoholics carrying the message, Bill and Bob carrying the message to AA number three, Bill Dodson. So it says the man of the bed was told of the acute poisoning from which he suffered how it deteriorates the body of the alcoholic and warps his mind. So what are we talking about with that acute poisoning, that deterioration, the warping of the body? Well, we're talking about that physical allergy, that once I start to drink, that I need more. And the more that I drink, the more that I need to drink, and that lack of control that I experience, that's what we're talking about. That thing that I take a drink and, and I get thirstier. And I don't do that with any other beverage. You know what I mean? I drink and I get thirsty. And so they're really talking about that. But this is also important. There was much talk about the mental state preceding the first drink. That, oh, yeah, there's the, there's the painted version of, of the man on the bed. I, so there was much talk about the mental state preceding that first drink. That's that mental obsession, that strange mental blank spot. When I'm as sober as I am today and my illness is untreated and I get that, nobody will know. This time will be different. Just going to go out tonight. I'm going to kill myself anyways. If you're going through what I was going through, you'd need to get drunk or loaded to that, that. And see, that's the thing. If I have experience with that loss of control, that inability to control the amount that I take, that means that I can't drink or, you know, whatever is bringing to you to this all-inclusive study today. You know, if I don't have control, that means I can't do it. I can't, I always refer to, I can't drink like a lady. I've not done anything in my life like a lady. So I don't know why I'd be surprised I can't drink like a lady. Um, but I can't drink like a lady, so I can't drink. But here's the, the real problem for me is that I know that I can't drink. I know I don't want to drink. I know I need to stay sober. I have to stay sober. But a day, a week, a month, a little while down the line, I get a thought in my mind that tells me it'll be okay. And I believe that lie and off I go. So that's that hopelessness that I need to stay sober because if I drink or use, it will kill me and I can't. No matter all the things and ways I try, I can't. And in, in explaining those symptoms, our friend AA number three, Bill, Bill Dotson said, yes, that's me, said the sick man. The very image, right? And if we hear of lack of control and lack of choice, doesn't that describe us? It says the very image. You fellows know your stuff all right. But I don't see what good it'll do. You fellows are somebody. I was once. He used to be a lawyer. But I'm a nobody now. 
From what you tell me, I know more than ever, I can't stop. At this, both the visitors burst into a laugh. So the future fellow anonymous, damn what all the laugh about that I can see. And so what I kind of want to point out is he's like, and I'm sure no one else can relate to that, like self-pity and that coming to the rooms and seeing people that are happy and they're sober and the lights are on and think, man, that's unattainable. But keep in mind, going back to, to the date they visited, they visited him June 28th, Dr. Bob's sobriety date. Now we celebrated this June 10th, but it actually was very likely June 17th. So Dr. Bob was only, what, 10, 11 days sober? You know what I mean? You guys are somebody. I'm hopeless. Dr. Bob, you know, 12 days, 12 days away from being exactly that same position. And the thing that I say and the thing that I emphasize and reemphasize, and I just, man, if there's nothing you else you get from this study, it's that it does not take long to get well. It does not take long to be in a position of recovery, a position of neutrality, safe and protected. It does not take long to have a message of depth and weight wrought out of experience. What did he do? All his effing amends. It does not take long. It doesn't take long to get well. And that is an important message. It's an important reminder. I don't have to wait. I don't have to wait if I'm new. I don't have to wait if I've been around a while and the magic's gone. I can get well very quickly. And also, we misjudge each other when we're new. You know what I mean? Like I always, I talk about this a lot where it's like when people were happy, I'm like, oh, they're just so full of themselves. No, they're just not filled with self-hatred. Now I got some stuff in the chat, so give me a second. Um, oh, yeah. So <laughs> we've got the... The picture of, and I, I've seen this turned into meeting posters where it's like the two guys, 12 stepping, you know, Bill Dotson, and then they put a little laptop on the screen and they're 12 stepping virtually. And what I will say is recovery does happen modem to modem as well as face to face. You know, that was a line that, man, I didn't think was true when I first read it, which was a number of years ago, but boy, in the last few years, isn't it true? One of the things we were joking about before the meeting is like, you know, weather. And, and I was talking about, you know, I, I have people that I work with across, across the world. And what a gift that is. What a gift that is, you know, to be a small part of somebody's recovery. And what like a gift to be a part of that chain. See that chain of Bill Wilson carrying that message to Dr. Bob. I mean, it goes back, Abby Thatcher carrying it to Bill. Bill carrying it to Dr. Bob and Bill and Bob carrying it to AA number three. We get to be a part of the continuation of that miracle. And man, what a powerful thing that is. Uh, oh, awesome. Pew, 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 welcome. Yeah, page 150, 157. All righty. So, uh, so the two friends. And so in that paragraph, what they were laying down was the foundation of step one. That was really his step one, that hopelessness. I know now more than ever, I'm going to drink again. I know now more than ever, I can't stop. I know now more than ever, I am hopeless. That's his step one. And now what they're offering is the information about the solution, the second step. The two friends spoke of their spiritual experience and the course and told him about the course of action they carried out. And again, I just want to point something out. When we share our experience, strength, and hope, it's not just our experience with the illness. It is my experience with the spiritual awakening, my experience with these steps, with this course of action. So they're laying down the foundation for step two. They're giving information on what our solution is, spiritual experience but also laying down the foundation for step three. Hey, this is the course of action that we got to take to get that spiritual experience. You want to do it or no? <laughs> but also that, uh, that what our program of action is, the 12 steps. He interrupted as, as I mean, I'll just say when I was new, I was 
I'm sure I have lots of opinions of why I don't know. Let me tell you what I think about the course of action that I've not taken. You know, I'm sure I did that. He interrupted. I used to be strong for the church, but that won't fix it. I prayed to God on hangover morning and sworn that I'd never touch another drop. Anyone here ever swear that's it? I'm never going to touch another drop. And then, yeah. And then by nine o'clock, I'd be boiled as an owl. Also, randomly, this is where that sticker comes from. I sometimes make stickers, and uh, it says recovered from being boiled as an owl. <laughs> so um, just, I use some weird language, and I describe some. Listen, listen, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just really into ornithologic -y. birds. I'm into birds, and yes, I pronounced that word wrong. <laughs> I don't have a drinking problem. I'm just enjoying humid owls is what I'm doing. Also, um, for the loved ones in your life, please, please don't, please don't do that. Oh, we actually have a definition for boil as an owl. Glassy-eyed drunk, yeah. And you know how like owls, they got the, the big old eyes, just, yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Yes, boiled as an owl at a whoopee party. Absolutely. And it, I will let you know, the fact that I can no longer be boiled as an owl at a whoopee party, it does not behoove me to squawk about it. That's a reference to last week for those that were here. And for those that weren't, I apologize sincerely. I probably owe you guys an amends. Anywho. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, boiled as an owl. Yeah, and, and Rob's coming in with the definition of a whoopee party. Just, we got all the tangents and definitions. Woo! Big one steady away. <laughs> all right, so the next day found the prospect more receptive. He'd been thinking it over. Maybe you're right, he said. God ought to be able to do anything. That sounds like a step two to me. The God is bigger than my problem that God is bigger than my hopelessness, that a spiritual experience might be possible for somebody like me. And then he added, he sure didn't do much for me when I was trying to fight this booze racket alone. On the third day, the lawyer gave his life to the care and direction of his creator, capital C creator. That's just another synonym for, for God, higher power, creator, spirit of the universe and said he was perfectly willing to do anything necessary. That sounds like a third step to me, being willing to go to any length. His wife, who did not divorce him, his wife came scarcely daring to be hopeful, though she thought she saw something different about her husband already. He had begun to have a spiritual experience. That afternoon, he put on his clothes and walked from the hospital free man. And what I want to point out is, like, it's not directly pointed to, but he did take the actions of the steps. And it's very likely he took the actions of the steps while he was still in the hospital. They didn't take long to work this thing. They didn't take long to do it. They didn't take long to have a spiritual experience. And so it says he entered a political campaign, making speeches, frequenting men's gathering places of all sorts, Often staying up all night. What gone from a boiled owl to a bit of a night owl, eh? Uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> um, he lost the race by only a narrow margin, but he had found God, and in finding God, he had found himself. And that is a powerful line. Now, for those that have been coming to this study, I, I God, I, I always feel bad because I'm like, you guys get a lot of repeats. Uh, but I speak a lot about how I came here with absolute self-hatred, a self-loathing that, um, like, there were people, I have a friend who's like, I, I never saw anyone who was as negative and hated themselves as much as you did, Paige. Like, that's truly who I was when I got here. And being somebody that negative, that self-deprecating, uh, it was a little unpleasant for the people around me. And uh, they would offer suggestions like, Paige, you got to do affirmations. You got to learn to love yourself. You got to say nice things to yourself in the mirror. And I was never, I hated myself too much to do that. Like, absolutely not. Now, you know, I, I could do 
I used to uh, do a meeting that was frequented by a lot of people at a treatment center and you, you weren't allowed to swear at the treatment center. So when I swore, they, they'd try to make me do affirmations and oh goodness, I would do the most passive aggressive affirmations you've ever heard in your life. You know, like I'm not the, ab I'm grateful that I'm not the absolute worst. It didn't count. They didn't want me to do some real ones. And I, I just, I couldn't get there. I couldn't get out of self-hatred that way. I couldn't get out of self-loathing by telling myself nice things that I didn't believe that just, and it is okay if that is your experience. I'm just sharing mine. What my experience was is this sentence, but he had found God and in finding God, he had found himself. I came and I did some action, these 12 steps, if we're wondering what the actions were. I came and took some actions that I didn't like, that I didn't believe in, that I didn't think would help me, that I didn't think I was worthy of. And a change happened to me. And it wasn't even, man, it was, I started to awaken to the reality. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you my experience. Sometimes I would hear people say, you, you can't love others unless you love yourself. You got to love yourself first. And if that's your experience, wonderful. It's just not mine. I would sit before someone, especially during their fifth step, and I've shared this. They would share the worst things they ever did, the worst things about themselves. They would share their guilt, their shame. And I loved them more. I talk about this a lot, but man, I'm, I'm not doing better than God. I'm not doing better than God at the loving department. And that became so clear and so evident when I was working with others. Your, and I really do mean your, like if you're in the study today, if you're listening to the study today, your inherent work, your inherent goodness, it became so evident as I saw that transformation, as I saw the light come on in your eyes, as I saw those defects fall from you. See, I'm not my defects because my defects are what gets removed. I saw that inherent worth and value, and I saw that it wasn't earned by doing good, and I saw it wasn't diminished by falling down and maybe not living up to expectations. I saw that so true in you, in sponsoring others. And then I just saw that maybe I wasn't so special, but that wasn't true for me too. That was it. That was it. And man, like I'm, I'm going through some grief at the moment. So I'm not like little miss happy joys and free right now. Like I've got some, some heavy feelings, but I'll tell you, like, it was, you know, like a month ago where I was like, I've been living my life on hard mode. Do you know that like hating yourself all the time, that's, that's way harder than not hating yourself. You know, like I had that thought, but I couldn't get there. I couldn't get there through affirmations. I couldn't get there through trying to love myself. And this is just my experience. And if yours is different, that's absolutely okay. I could only get there through doing these 12 steps and working with others and awakening to the reality of that unconditional love that is the God of my understanding. And of course, I forget that sometimes and I wake up and everyone hates me in my mind. Um, I'm not that important for everyone to hate me. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, if, if you're having a tough time, what I want to remind you is you are inherently worthy and loved by the God that I have found through these steps, exactly as you are in this moment. And the 12 steps in my experience have allowed me to open up to that love. It was, it's there whether I'm falling down and failing or not. It's there when I'm being, you know, Captain 12 Step, you know, St. Page. You know, it's it's always there. Um, I've been told not to try to be St. Page. <laughs> um, aim, for, <laughs> aim for perfection, fall way short. <laughs> Anywho. Um, and so that was June 1935. And so sobriety date uh, was June 26th when when he en entered the hospital. June 28th is when they they, you know, met with him. He never drank again. And so what we're seeing is that permanent sobriety is possible. He too has become a respected and useful member of his community. He has helped other men to recover and is a power in the church from which he is long absent. And, and some of us might be wondering, okay, why is he mentioning his political race? 
why is it mentioning, you know, he, he was a member of the church? Why is it, you know, mentioning all of that? Well, keep in mind the stigma that existed in those days. And so what it's saying is that people who were often shunned in asylums can now be a part of the world, a part of their community. So I think they're pointing to that, like kind of breaking through, uh, I don't want to say punching, but punching stigma. I just, I'm a very visual person. Um, and that's what they're trying to do, break through that stigma. And so, uh, so now you see there were three alcoholics in that town who now felt they had to give to others what they had found or be sunk. And again, the importance of 12-step work, I need to give to others that which I found. Spiritual awakening brought about by these 12 steps or I will drink again. I will use again. It's not, it's not extra credit. It's the main curriculum. For, for, I know in the States, the kids are going back to school soon. So that's a teaching reference. No, I don't know. So it says after several failures to find another, the fourth turned up. And this devil may care young chap, Ernie Galbraith. Yeah, and you'll find the spelling in the chat. This is this is our guy Ernie, and, and man, it's it that story. It's a doozy. I'll probably, you know what? I'll probably tell it as we get there. But let's focus on this for now. So uh, he came through an acquaintance who had heard the good news, and see, that's the thing is, oh yeah, there's there's Ernie, and is that right beside Sue? Is that Ernie and Sue, Rob? Uh, oh, it's Sue. We'll talk about Sue. It's it's just a fun. There she is. Um, Sue's no, I'll, I'll explain who Sue is in a bit. I don't want to spoil it. It's a it's a plot twist. I'm so sorry, guys. Oh gosh. Uh, so um, he came to our acquaintance who had heard the good news, and I just want to point out who had heard the good news. Their sobriety and their actions were carrying that message. People were talking about it, not because, oh, they've got good ideas and let's talk about their good ideas, but because they were demonstrating the power, they were demonstrating that change. So he proved to be a devil may care young fellow whose parents could not make out whether he wanted to stop drinking or not. They were deeply religious people, much shocked by their son's refusal to have anything to do with the church. He suffered horribly from his sprees. And I just want to point out that might be an indication that he has the physical allergies. You know, if I'm drinking into sprees from which I'm coming to and I'm suffering horrible physical and mental symptoms, it's probably an indication I have a lack of control and I'm not able to control the amount that I take. But it seemed as if nothing could be done for him. Again, hopeless. Hopeless is a good place to be. He consented, however, to go to the hospital where he acquired the very room recently vacated by the lawyer. He had three visitors. And see, that's the thing. Yeah, the three visitors were Dr. Bob, Bill, and Bill, Bill Dubs and Bill Dots. Billy Dubs and Billy Dots. They probably did not consent to being called that, but I just, I just do that. Uh, and it's an indication, like that's how desperate they were to work with people. That we're, there's a guy that's maybe wanting help. They're all showing up together, you know? And it says they, after a bit, he, uh, he Ernie Galbraith, says, the way you fellows put that spiritual stuff makes sense. I'm ready to do business. Being ready to do business is a third step decision. I'm ready and willing to do this work. I guess the old folks, his parents, were right after all. So one more was added to the fellowship. And so uh, Ernie Galbraith, it, it's, this, the, this story does, well, it, in a long sense, it's got a happy ending. In an even longer sense, it's got a horrifically tragic ending. But uh, Ernie Galbraith, he didn't end up staying sober. Uh, he relapsed. And while he was on a relapse, he goes to Dr. Bob's house, as, as you know, you do, showing up, finding, finding the sponsor. Uh, and he, he runs into a, a young, a very young woman. Um, and it's like, do you, do you know where Dr. Do you know where Dr. Robert Smith's house is? And she's like, why, yes. 
that's my father. And they take a liking to each other. Dr. Bob Swansea, who's out on a bender, and his daughter. I think we know where this is going. So they obviously get married, right? As, as I mean, maybe you guys have had healthy relationships and can't relate to this, uh, but they, they get married and they, it is, it is rocky. He didn't, he didn't get sober again. And, and, and one of the things, you know, when I talk about people like Hank or Ernie, where they, they didn't get sober again, what's like, kind of, what's the message in that? You know, it's like, well, what happened? And we spoke about how Hank had, you know, a sex ideal he didn't live up to, and, and he was maybe shy on, on doing some of the spiritual stuff. But, you know, if I have sobriety in this moment, if I have a moment of separation. I have a gift. You know what I mean? I, I've been given a gift. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. I wasn't worthy of it. And what I do with that gift is what matters. See, if I'm sober today, heck, if I'm recovered or not, if I'm here today and I'm sober, I have a chance. I have a chance to absolutely radically transform my life and to get the real gift that's on offer. But if I don't do anything in this little moment of sobriety, I will drink again. I will use again. I will be off again. And I don't know if I will ever get that opportunity again. So if I have a moment of willingness, if I have a moment, the, the, at least the message for me is take it. Take it. Do dive in. Do the stuff the stuff that, that weirdo page is saying to do that I don't think is going to work for me. Do that stuff that I'm not willing to do. Dive in and do it. And I promise I have gotten well despite myself repeatedly. You know what I mean? I regularly take actions I don't want to take. And you know the kicker? I do them. And then after a while, I want to take them. You know what I mean? Like, I enjoy them. I know some people are going to be like, you like inventory? Yes, because what comes with inventory is freedom. I don't love amends, but I love the results of amends. I love working with others. Prayer and meditation have changed how my brain works, how I show up to life. Yeah, it's only a pain in the ass when I'm not doing it. That's when it sucks. You know what I mean? Oh, it's so much work. It's only so much work when I'm when I'm not doing it. At least that's been my experience. And so, yeah, Ernie Galbraith. And, and so um, it's maybe a little too dark to go into the very sad, very, very sad uh, later on ending, but I'll, I'll go with the, I'll go with the kind of happy ending is they did, they did eventually divorce um, and uh, Sue ended up marrying her old high school sweetheart. So, um, but yeah, and, and it's also a reminder that just because we get sober, does not mean family dynamics are going to be easy to easy to navigate, or I'm sober and everybody's going to be the rainbows and unicorns that we were discussing. Um, and that it is as important to practice these spiritual principles, these tools, when, when Ernie's dating your daughter, gosh darn it, as when, you know, she's finally with her, you know, who she was meant to be with and everything's great. You know what I mean? So, that's a, that's kind of the at least the story that I I get from it. So um, all this time, our friend of the hotel lobby incident—that's Bill Wilson. He's that's who we're referring to. Remained in that town. He was there three months. He now returned home, leaving behind the first acquaintance, the lawyer, and the devil may care chat. So Bill Wilson, he's living in Akron, Ohio, working with others, but he's got to move home. And it says these men had found something brand new in life. And that's, and at least that's for me what my spiritual awakening, and like, believe me, I've had more than one. I, I can't stay well on one. Just like I couldn't stay well on one drink, I can't stay well on one experience. But that's what it has been for me you know, something new in life, new in life. I don't hate myself. That, that, that is new. I mean, I remember, this is maybe a little dark, but I remember being in kindergarten and thinking, 
I shouldn't be here. I remember being suicidal in the third grade. Enjoying life, new. Joy, new. Happiness, new. Contented sobriety, new. Usefulness to others, new. A sense of confidence, not in myself, but in something greater than myself, new. Serenity, new. You know what I mean? New. And if I, and that's the thing, it might be scary, man, what's, what's going to, what's on the other side is, is brand new, but it's not brand new as I'm like, ah, it's scary. It's brand new as I'm like, man, more than I could have ever imagined. Because, man, I remember when I was new, the gentleman, he would always say, Paige, everything you want in your life is outside of your comfort zone. And I would tell him, well, I wouldn't tell him this. No, because I was new. I'm not going to have a conversation and I'm not going to express how I really feel. I'd be like, uh-huh, yep, yeah, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. uh, please stop talking to me. Don't ask me if I have a sponsor yet. You know what I mean? That sort of newcomer response to things. Uh, but what was happening in my mind was absolutely not. Everything in life I want is not outside of I want my comfort zone. It is I would like my little comfy zone. That is what I would like. I would like to stay here. <laughs> yeah. And what I did not realize is, of course, he was right. Um, but every time I take those leaps of faith outside of my comfort zone, my comfort zone grows. If you don't know what I'm talking about, who here, like me, I didn't talk in meetings for my first however many months, couldn't speak in a meeting. Now I'm doing it for a whole hour. You guys are like, is it, is it the hour yet? You know what I mean? But I'm doing it for a whole hour. Sharing our first meeting, like making that first amends, working with that first spot, see those things. Yeah, it's just how we live life, that comfort zone growth. So that was just my little um, tangent of hope for getting outside the comfort zone or that fear of change that I'm sure no one else has. <laughs> so it says, they knew they knew they must help other alcoholics if they would remain sober. And that's, that's the first reason I do it. I do it. I work with others because I have to. I work with others because it's part of permanent sobriety. But it says that motive became secondary. So we do it because we have to at first. And then something, I don't know about you, but what it says in the book and what I experience is that reason changes. It was transcended. So, you know, just overcome or, you know, this, this reason won the race by the happiness they found in giving themselves for others. Man, there's that something about being a small part of somebody's miracle. You know, sitting down with them and, and receiving their fifth step. I help people with their inventory. I help them with the men. Seeing that light come on, seeing that transformation, watching them help others. Man, that is the coolest thing. You know, I, I have friends that talk about like, that's the God joke. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm after. That's, that's the stuff. They shared their homes, their slender resources, and gladly devoted their spare hours to fellow sufferers. They were willing by day or night to place a new man in the hospital and visit him afterward. And again, I, I think it's kind of pointing to what we were talking about in, in working with others, that it's, a, it's meant to be a little inconvenient. It doesn't have to be all the way inconvenient, but I always say, if I'm not a little inconvenienced, I probably don't have enough sponsees. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be a little inconvenient. And I had somebody ask me, like, Paige, why do you say that? And it's really because if I'm in charge of my giving, and if I'm in charge of my sort of limits, Listen, I'm busy. I got Netflix. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I actually don't think I have Netflix anymore. Uh, I was on somebody else's account. Uh, with their consent, for those that are wondering, they, 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 any focus, uh, wasn't sneaky about it. Uh, but uh, it's, it's truly, man, I can't tell you how many times the presence of God has been so clear when I'm giving to somebody and I did not effing want to. So many times I'm, sh man, I am on it. I'm, on, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, so uh, I'm on a tangent, uh, but I, 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 fe I feel kind of, I didn't expect it. We're wrapping up after this paragraph, so don't worry, we're not going too far. But um, I just, uh, I was saying before the meeting, um, the woman who was my first ever sponsor, um, she um, passed away um, very suddenly, and it's, 
not of this illness and it's it's really tragic and that's part of you know bringing up some grief and you know I had this experience um uh, she was still my sponsor at the time and it was after um it was after I got sick and I was filled um, with self-hatred and self-pity the why me the poor me if there's a God, you know, why did this happen? I'm doing all the things I think I should be doing. And, and here I am in a wheelchair, vomiting every day, living this life that, that did not seem fair. And then I experienced the thing that many of us experience, which is a death after a death, after a death, after a death. And, and um, I'm a human being. I, I, you know, it's been a little different the last few years, but I, I was always somebody I'd go to funerals. You know, I'd go to funerals and, and you know, I remember um, I was, uh, it was just one of those days, I describe it as, as wanting to do the emotional turtle, you know, pull the covers over your head and pretend nobody's there because I just can't do it anymore. One of those. And God showed up and God showed up as God so often does as an alcohol, as, as an alcoholic who needed my help because there was one more death, and one more funeral. And I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be there. And he calls me up and he says, Paige, can you come with me? I need you to be there for me. Because you guys taught me well. I said yes to an action I didn't want to take, to do a thing that I didn't want to do, to something that felt uncomfortable for me. And I remember that night I didn't sleep very well. And I got up in the morning and I was sitting out front of the house in my wheelchair. And at that time in my life, I, I really wasn't living in that fourth dimension of existence. I wasn't living in that peace and that serenity. That was one of those few times that I felt that deep and profound inner peace. I was present and I was present to that presence. And then my friend comes and picks me up and we go to the funeral and it was um, just heartbreaking. You know, it was a young man and watching his parents having to say goodbye to him and it was hard. And as we were leaving the funeral, there's a woman who came up to me and she was also in a wheelchair. And she said, I'm so glad you're here because I don't feel so alone. And see, for somebody like me, I have that deep sense of unworthiness, that uselessness, that self-pity. I have this deep sense of what the F is the point of my life? Because you guys know my life doesn't maybe look how people think it should. My life doesn't look all big and fancy. You know, I'm, I'm hanging out here helping people. Like, this This is my life. But maybe but maybe God's will for a little, little drunk, a little crackhead like me is to show up and be of love and service. And man, I promise that has given my life more meaning and purpose than I could have ever imagined. And just showing up, saying yes, helping others, and allowing myself to be inconvenienced. And so it says, they grew in numbers. They experienced a few distressing failures. But in those cases, they made an effort to bring the man's family into a spiritual way of living. This thing is a way of life. It's not a set it and forget it program. It is a way of life. And, you know, again, that idea in two wives, you know, that if the best thing I can do for those that I love, who are maybe not open to the idea of step, not open to the idea of working a program, the best effing thing that I can do is work these steps like my life depends on it and be a complete demonstration of this power. Not telling you what you should do, but demonstrate that how the change has happened to me. But in those cases, they made an effort to bring the man's family into a spiritual way of living thus relieving much worry and suffering. And so we'll wrap it up there. And next week, that was too ambitious to think we'd get through the whole one, eight pages, eight pages, delusional. That's me. So keep, come back next week and we'll, and we'll wrap it up. And the following week, we'll kick it off from the beginning. So thank you guys for, thanks for coming.